There was a time, and in some places around the world, it still may be true, that preaching the gospel is considered a dangerous profession. And in the eyes of some, preachers are considered dangerous preachers. For the most part, though, we preachers in America today, and I saw Bob Moncarell come in, I thought, and he did affirm this perhaps. For the most part, we preachers in America today have been domesticated. <laughs> Very little said from pulpits today upsets folks. We often hear things like, what a sweet little sermon. <laughs> or, our preacher was so cute today. <laughs> Preachers are more likened today to a cocker spaniel or a basset hound than a pit bull. If what we're saying is even remembered after you walk out the door, and I know it's not that often. In fact, I sometimes walk out the door, and I'm grateful now that I can hear myself on Facebook to remind myself what I said. <laughs> And even if it is remembered, it's often looked upon as harmless. Now, once in a while, a preacher will say something that gets noticed, gets the church folks all up in arms, maybe even gets news coverage. <laughs> That's more likely to happen when preaching on a passage that is widely known. Now you can preach on some obscure passage from 2 Chronicles or Zechariah and you can say whatever you want and no one's going to get upset. They didn't even know there was such a book. <laughs> but mess with the familiar stuff. The passages and stories learned in nursery school and you risk getting called upon the ecclesiastical carpet. Today's scripture falls into that category. Jonah, even for those of you who haven't spent a whole lot of time in the book, the Bible, I bet you recognize the name Jonah. Perhaps as a child you remember hearing the story of Jonah and the whale, or Jonah in the belly of the big fish, and a whale of a story it is. In fact, some might say it sounds a little fishy. <laughs> I know that was sort of cheap. <laughs> but I agree with William Carter, a Presbyterian pastor from Pennsylvania, who says, I hope you don't think for a minute that the story of Jonah is a fish story. No, it's not a fish story. If this were simply the story about a man stuck in the belly of a big fish, then very few of us would find much in this story to which we could relate. Now some of us may have traveled some unusual journeys, but I, I seriously doubt, raise your hand if it's true, that any of us have ever trekked our way through the intestinal tract of a big fish, or any other creature for that matter. Now, I can say I have been vomited on, and most of you who, if you've been parents or grandparents or picked up a baby, you've been vomited on. But I don't think I've ever been vomited up. No, if we get caught trying to figure out the logistics or the mechanics required to take this story literally, then we're going to lose the point of the story. This is not a story whose central theme is a regurgitating fish. Rather, this is a story about relationships as they relate to acts of justice and mercy. Now, there's a topic to which we perhaps have some interest, justice and mercy in relationships. If you're like me, almost every day I'm confronted with some sort of decision to whether speak out and stand up for what I think is right versus Keep my mouth shut, quietly forgive, accept others where they're at. If you're like me, you probably find it a whole lot easier to talk about the wrongs that need made right with anybody and everybody but the one who can make them right. <laughs> 
That involves confrontation, and confrontation is quite often uncomfortable, even dangerous. Perhaps it is a fear of confrontation or realization of how much energy it takes to be confrontational which guides Jonah's response to God's call upon his life. In the very first words of this book, God says, Hey Jonah, I've got a job for you. Go to the great city of Nineveh and cry out against that wicked city and all the nasty people who live there. So what does Jonah do? He gets up and he goes all right. He goes to the city of Joppa and he marches right down to the dock on the Mediterranean Sea and he hops aboard a ship that's going in the opposite direction. God said go east to Nineveh and Jonah heads west to Tarshish somewhere around the rock of Gibraltar. Now if you know the story of Jonah, you may remember what happens next. A storm arises on the sea, and Jonah is thrown overboard to appease the storm. And the Lord God sends a great big fish to grab Jonah and bring him back east, back to the shore where he started. During the return trip, Jonah prays a flawlessly composed prayer in the belly of the fish. It was a beautiful prayer, and it causes the fish to cop him up. <laughs> And God says for a second time, Jonah, get going to Nineveh. Go to that great city and do what I want you to do. Well, Reverend William Carter, the men, gentleman who I mentioned before, said, and I agree, certainly this is a whale of a tale, but it's not a fish story. It is the story of a man who was called upon to do something for God and he doesn't want to do it. What was it about that city of Nineveh which was so repulsive to Jonah? Dr. Haddon Robinson, a professor from a seminary, Gordon Cornwell in Massachusetts, says Jonah, a prophet, had been commanded by God to preach to the citizens of Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of the nation of Assyria. And Jonah was to tell the Assyrians that judgment was on its way. God had had enough. And he knew that if he did that, if he told them that, well, they just might repent and be forgiven. And that was hard for Jonah to deal with. For you see, Jonah hated the Assyrians. The Assyrians were easy to hate. If you were to wrap up in one package, Nazi Germany, and Iraq and Iran at their worst, you can get a feel for Assyria. The Assyrians were arrogant and they were cruel conquerors and Jonah despised them. To tell Jonah that he was to preach to the Assyrians was like asking a man whose family had been threatened by terrorists to offer those terrorists forgiveness, complete forgiveness. Forgiveness? Nothing would have pleased Jonah more than to see the whole bunch of those Assyrians just blasted off the face of the earth. Those Assyrians may have mattered to God, but they didn't matter to Jonah. Reluctantly, Jonah gives in to God's call, and he makes his way to Nineveh on a mission for justice. Now, there's some question about exactly what Jonah is called upon to do. Certainly, it involves preaching. Jonah is called upon to speak up against the city because, you see, the wickedness of the city has literally been thrown into God's face. What we do know is that when Jonah got to Nineveh, Jonah preached a sermon with only five Hebrew words in it. Loosely translated, it goes something like this. Hey, Nineveh, in 40 days, you're going to be blasted to bits the sermon. Jonah walks one full day into the middle of the city. All the time he, pre he preaches that same sermon over and again. That same five word sermon. He starts preaching that sermon and even though the people of Nineveh don't speak Hebrew they began to take notice of Jonah. I mean, how could they not? <laughs> 
three days in the belly of a fish, and the digestive gases have bleached him white. His clothes are ragged, and he's missing a couple of teeth, and he still has a little seaweed hanging from his left ear, and he strolls into the center of town, and he belts out his message, and then he begins the countdown. 40 days, 39 days, 38. Well, the good news is, the people believe God. What? The people of Nineveh cry out to God, and they change their evil ways. <laughs> and the king of Nineveh even hears the sermon that Jonah is preaching, and he repents. And according to the story, even the cattle hear the sermon, and they repent. And not only that, according to the story, God is so impressed with Jonah's sermon, even God repents. That's what it says. The Lord God Almighty changed his mind. Thanks to Jonah, everybody has turned their face toward God, which is what God wanted. That's good news, right? Well, the bad news is, when Jonah sees all of this repenting going on, he gets furious. He says, Dad, can it, God? That's why I ran from your face in the first place. For when I go out there and risk my life and I preach doom and destruction, I want doom and destruction. But here you are, God, you're so merciful, and you're so kind, and you're so forgiving, and it just makes me sick. <laughs> Jonah, you see, with a little encouragement from a fish with a bellyache, had finally agreed to be an agent of God's justice, set things right with those people. But by God, this mercy stuff was asking too much. You see, Jonah's struggle is the human struggle. It is our struggle. It is the tension that we feel between what we think are two competing forces. Justice on the one hand, and mercy on the other. We use those two ways of relating to form dividing lines between us, do we not? There is the justice crowd. Some of you are a part of it. It's your middle name. You stand for justice, for what's right. We can divide today into the justice crowd and the mercy crowd, and we put the justice crowd on the right. You know, the justice crowd. Those who know the rules, who enforce the rules, who keep the order, who punish the wrongs, who march for the rights. Thank God for you folks. Well, and then there's the mercy crowd over on our left. The believing hearts who search for the good in every human soul. Who strive to believe the best about the worst who welcome the fallen back time and time and time and time again. And in our world, those two crowds often see themselves as defenders of God's truth against the forces of the other. <coughs> perhaps what this story represents, and what perhaps is consistently conveyed in other stories of Scripture, is a marriage between these two forces, between justice and mercy. In Christ, justice and mercy meet at the altar of God's truth. The record of history confirms how much justice and mercy need one another. History teaches us that justice without mercy can lead to some very awful things, like Nazism, fascism, totalitarian dictators, radical religion, 
whether it be Islam or others, fundamentalist Christianity, Westboro Baptist Church, marching at the funeral of our soldiers saying we hate the fags. That's justice without mercy. On the other hand, mercy without justice can lead to cheap grace, to chaos. Without question, the greatest struggle for most of us has always been to find mercy for ourselves or for others. What upsets Jonah is God's willingness to forgive and embrace those nasty Ninevites. The story of Jonah holds before us a, a picture of a God that is so loving and so patient and so relentlessly gracious that it pushes us to extend our human boundaries of God's infinite grace. How graceful can you be, God? Mm. How graceful can he be? Amazing grace is not just a beloved him. It's at the heart of who God is and how God relates. The question is, can we stomach God's mercy? You may remember the elder son in the story of the prodigal son. He could not stomach the father's mercy towards the prodigal. That mercy seemed to him to be a travesty of justice. Here he was, the good son, the one who had stayed home on the farm doing what he was supposed to do, did his chores, lived his life responsibly. And here comes his no good, recklessly living brother being thrown a party. <coughs> Some may understand completely where the elder brother is coming from and where Jonah is coming from. A couple weeks back, a controversy arose. <coughs> Duke University, great institution associated with Methodism, in fact, decided to play over their bell tower, the bells calling Muslims to prayer five times a day allowing the Muslims to, to use that instrument to gather and pray, pray in the way that they pray. And it, it rose a controversy. Franklin Graham got into the middle of it. <clears throat> Some people said, well, you know, that's Christians paid for that bell tower. Why would they let Muslims use it? It's not just. And Franklin Graham with his bully pulpit got enough large donors from Duke University to put pressure upon and the university back down. I don't know. wonder what Jesus would have done. Sure, you can use our bell tower if you're using it to pray. For if you're praying, you're not killing. If you're praying, your heart might be changed. Justice and mercy need one another. But as the scripture says, God's ways are not always our ways. His ways are sometimes <clears throat> far beyond anything we can logically explain. For radical love that's handed out in acts of mercy turns out to be the only salvation any of us will ever find. And it's ironic, but justice, which is making the world right, also depends upon that radical love that is expressed through words and deeds of mercy. Mercy is what keeps the fight for justice from crossing the line into vengeance. Mercy does not mean ignoring injustice or refusing to work to right the wrongs. Mercy turns that fight for justice into a search for healing. Now this morning, we may have wrongs in our own lives that need to be made right. We certainly may be aware of wrongs in the lives of others that need to be made right. But are we equally aware of how God's grace and mercy have been extended into our lives? And are we willing to be agents and prophets and servants of mercy in the lives of those around who need now, 
If you're part of the mercy crowd, maybe you're ready to jump up and cheer. But let me remind you.